Okay, so let's see. Our setup is as usual. We have a nice uh, Riemannian manifold. Let's say smooth, connected. <coughs> These induce geodesic distance. Uh, very important uh, for everything is that MB geodesically convex. Uh, and we're assuming that uh, our measure has a density with respect to Riemannian uh, volume uh, measure, uh, which is right now is going to be C2 smooth because we want to take two derivatives of it. And mo moreover, <coughs> it, it's going to be positive right, on the entire uh, manifold. So sometimes I'll use psi, sometimes I'll use, actually probably it won't really appear, but sometimes instead of psi I'm thinking about the potential V. So psi is equal to exponential of minus V. And we define, uh, given a parameter capital N in all this range, minus infinity to infinity, the generalized uh, Ricci curvature tensor, depending on all the data, the metric, uh, the measure, and this parameter capital N, as a generalization of the usual Ricci curvature, so it's Ricci minus, so, so this takes <coughs> into account the intrinsic curvature coming from the geometry, and this, this takes care of the uh, kind of curvature coming from the density psi, <coughs> you will notice that the parameter is capital N minus little n, and we already talked about the logarithmic Hessian. Uh, it's a generalization of just taking the Hessian of the log, or minus the log uh, of V, so you also add some rank one perturbation. <coughs> and we'll see today why it's actually convenient to remember both of these representations. They're exactly the same. Uh, just, just take two derivatives here and check that this is equal to that. And when capital N is equal to little n, this corresponds to the constant density case which just gives you back when density is constant, this is just zero, you, give, you get back the classical Ricci curvature tensor. <coughs> so this is the case capital N equals little n, and capital N equals plus infinity, you get, uh, this just drops out, and you get Ricci plus, oh yeah, of course I have a, a mistake, this is supposed to be not V, but log of psi, so sorry, this is log of psi, log of psi, log of psi, this only affects the sign here. So here, sorry, here it doesn't affect anything, here it affects the sign. Okay, so sorry about that, it should be uh, log of psi. So the lo logarithmic Hessian, this, this term drops down, and this should be a second derivative of log of psi, and this just boils down to the usual Hessian of the logarithm. Okay, so this is why I explained my notation as log hash. Okay, so kind of the finite dimensional version of <coughs> logarithmic Hessian. Okay, uh, and finally we say that our weighted manifold satisfies the curvature dimension condition, C, D, rho, N, if uh, um, there exists some, well, some real value parameter rho, so that uh, as positive, uh, as positive definite uh, symmetric tensors, <coughs> let's say this is bigger than rho times the metric on the manifold. Okay? And indeed, if you're familiar with the original Bakunin redefinition using gamma, uh, gamma 2, then these, this definition is equivalent uh, to that in this range. They're completely different outside this range. Okay, we're going to use this definition. It's more geometric. <coughs> okay, so, uh, right, so let's continue. So what do we, uh, now I claim that indeed uh, this 1D localization, <coughs> whenever we localize into one-dimensional uh, needles, then this actually preserves the curvature dimension condition. Okay, so let's see why. So assume <coughs> that we have uh, some uh, C2, let's say smooth hypersurface on our manifold, okay, with unit normal, so this is S, let's say, we have unit normal field nu, okay, just because N is already taken, let's call this nu, okay, and we would like to consider the uh, normal map, so uh, for some reason I'll know this by F of S, and this is just the exponential map in the direction of the normal, okay, so if I have a point here X, uh, X, I'm just going to continue along the geodesic until I reach Fs x t after distance after going in the direction of nu to a distance of t. Okay, <coughs> so this is so t parameterizes uh, the the uh, length of the extension of my normal ray, and x is a point on my hypersurface S. Okay, uh, and you know it's defined on these pairs x and t, so it's you know I, I I would like to if the manifold were complete, so it would be really S times all of R, okay, I could extend uh, geodesics indefinitely, but okay, I don't know, maybe whatever the manifold is not complete, or maybe later it'll have a boundary, so whatever, let's call the domain. I'm, I'm not, you know, for some reason here I insist on this, but I'm not really trying to be rigorous in, in these lectures, but uh, so it's defined on the domain, okay, some subset of S cross R. 
So uh, <coughs> again, not, not very crucial, but uh, just for your uh, kind of uh, uh, why, why not learn about this. Uh, so this, there's a little business about uh, radius, I mean, uh, cut loci and uh, radii of injectivity. So I'll denote by L sub x the injectivity interval. So that's the maximal open, I'll, I'll, I'll always take the open interval. Um, uh, I'll take the interior of this interval. So it will be the maximal open <laughs> interval containing the origin so that for any t in this, in this interval, <coughs> the distance from this point to s is indeed t. Or if I'm going in the negative direction, the absolute value of t. So uh, of course, in the beginning, by whatever, uh, 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 by tubular neighborhood theorem, whatever, <coughs> then we know that there is some epsilon where this guy is indeed injective, okay, where the distance is indeed t. But after a certain while, maybe the distance is no longer t. For instance, this can happen for various reasons. Let's say I'm here, so I'm extending to a distance of t. But you see, somehow I, I'm kind of, I have this positive curvature here. I have, uh, let's say, uh, one principal curvature, which is, uh, which is kind of positively curved. So after a while, after a while, the distance here, there's a point which is closer. This is reflected by the fact that these rays are kind of, at least locally, they're converging onto this point, which is called uh, a focal point. Okay, so after a while, maybe after this point, for instance, the distance will no longer be t. Maybe there's a point. Uh, I mean, if if you, you can test this locally, so focal point is a point, so that you can see this locally, that there will be a guy that's going to actually uh, bring you closer to the manifold. Okay, so this is one reason this can happen. <coughs> Another reason this can happen is that let's say I'm extending here, maybe S does something and comes back like this. Okay, so if I'm extending to here. <coughs> you see, this is negatively curved. There's no, there's no focal point. There's nothing. Every, the rays are actually diverging. But somehow, I get a competing ray that meets me here in the middle. And uh, I just stop here, right? Beyond this distance, uh, it's no longer true that the distance to S is T. It's actually this guy, which is closer. OK, so I just stop here. And I define my interval, kind of the largest interval from the point X, uh, uh, as L sub X. OK? Um, yeah, it's not, not too crucial. Uh, well, but anyway, uh, and I'll you know by J of S X comma T to be the Jacobian <coughs> of this normal ray, normal map F sub S. So I need to tell you what kind of measures I'm using. So on S, I just take the induced uh, Riemannian volume, and on the T direction, I just take Lebesgue measure, okay, uh, on R, and uh, of course uh, on M, I just take the Riemannian volume measure on M, okay. So this means I can really uh, take a n minus one dimensional volume element here, a one dimensional guy here and see how uh, it expands and, extra and, and uh, contracts when I map to m through f of s. Right? So here, maybe the Jacobian is decreasing because I see some contraction. Here, it's, it's increasing. <coughs> and it's well known <coughs> that uh, if I look, uh, consider this domain, domain of uh, injectivity of the normal map, which is all points uh, x comma t, so that t is inside the interval of injectivity at x, Okay, so I'll call this whatever the domain of injectivity. Then indeed, <laughs> f of s is injective there. Okay, and in fact, I it's known that if I go beyond the interval, beyond the closure of the interval of injectivity, I will no longer be injective. This is really uh, up, up to what's going on on the boundary. You know, maybe it will be injective, maybe not. Uh, but beyond the boundary of this interval, I know I'm not going to be injective. This is really the domain of injectivity of this normal map. Uh, whatever is left. So you know, I, I can look at the image of f sub f. So, so you know, whatever, whenever, whatever f of s could potentially map. <coughs> so maybe, if, maybe I'm mapping all that I can. I'm really going. Uh, I don't care now about uh, whether I. Uh, so anything I could potentially map minus the, the the domain of injectivity is called the cut locus. So uh, let's say this point is on the cut locus. This guy. So maybe if s looks like this, maybe the cut locus. Uh, this is kind of the bad area which I will not get. <coughs> so this is the cut locus. I will not get the cut locus, but it's well known that uh, the cut locus has zero uh, Hausdorff n-dimensional Hausdorff measure. Okay, so the volume of the, the Riemannian volume of the cut locus is equal to zero. So I, I, I maybe I'm not getting the cut locus, but I don't care. Okay, <coughs> in terms of measure theory, I don't care. Uh, and finally, it's known that uh, the Jacobian here is going to be strictly positive on the domain of injectivity. Uh, the reason is that it's known that 
always a focal point. Uh, if it appears, it can only appear after a cut point. So uh, here, I really, uh, I mean, um, here, the reason there is a cut locus here is because of this focal point. Okay, rays are converging. Here, you see there's no focal point, okay? But what stops me is really because I got a ray coming from another direction. So this is a cut point. Uh, if I had a focal point, it will always be, it will never be before a cut point. So this is the statement. The Jacobian is strictly positive. It cannot be zero because if it were zero, I would be already outside my domain of injectivity, okay? So the Jacobian is really uh, uh, positive. Uh, which means that uh, FS is really a diffeomorphism uh, here, on, 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 here on, on, this, on, on this domain, injectivity. Okay, so if it's a diffeomorphism, <coughs> I can apply a change of variables. So for any nice test function, phi, I can write the integral of phi on whatever uh, I'm able to map. Uh, I should maybe write uh, whatever, I should write the domain of injectivity, but the difference uh, is just the cut locus, which has measure zero, so I don't care. So really, the integral uh, with respect to the Riemannian volume of whatever I'm able to map, I can write this uh, as uh, kind of uh, by, by, by using the Jacobian as integral over here times the integral over here times this Jacobian factor, just by definition of Jacobian. Okay, so that's my change of variables formula. <coughs> okay, so this is kind of without introducing any weight. Right? There's no weight here. There's no. We didn't use the, the measure mu. Now let's introduce the measure mu. So J S comma mu will denote the weighted Jacobian. So now I'm thinking of F S as a map from S equipped with this, with the usual volume measure, uh, but I multiply by the density psi. So you see, I, I marked in red just the new things I added. So I'll denote this volume of S comma mu. So it's the weighted volume measure on this hypersurface. Okay, it's weighted by the density psi. Of course, Lebesgue measure I kept. I didn't. I didn't check. I didn't change. And here, I'm mapping onto m. And now again, I, 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 uh, I use my weight, psi, here. Remember, this is, this is what we call mu, right? So psi times the remaining volume is mu. OK, so I added a weight here on s. I weighed by the weight function psi. And I weighed by the weight function psi on m. So really, the difference is it's exactly that we already saw. So js mu is the Jacobian that we had before times J of W. W stands for weighted. So just the contribution of the weighted Jacobian, which is, you, it's immediate. There's no computation. It's just psi. It's the density uh, uh, at the uh, point that, uh, of destination divided by the destiny. So it's the density at the point of destination and divided by the density at the point of origin. Okay, that's the contribution to the Jacobian of the weighted part. Okay? So in other words, you know, I just take the formula that I had before. And I just change all the measures with the weights. So it's the same formula exactly like we had here. Okay, only I add mu's everywhere. Mu, uh, mu, mu. Okay. So now this is the weighted Jacobian. Okay. And indeed, by the way, psi is, is seem to be positive, so no problem. Okay, it's really <coughs> no problem here. Um, I can do this, uh, and I know that this is still a diffeomorphism. So what did we obtain? In other words, we obtain uh, a one-dimensional localization uh, of the following form. So mu restricted onto whatever I can map with my normal rays from sending from s. I can write this as, so if I, I can write this as, this is true for any test function, right? So it's true on the level of measures. I can write this as the integral over s of these one-dimensional measures. Okay, mu, I'll call them here mu sub x, because remember, I, I was using mu sub alpha. Uh, before, so it's really a measure. So for any point x here, I get a one-dimensional measure supported on this geodesic given by the normal, by the normal ray. Okay, and uh, so this is just some weights on the x's. I don't really care what the weight is. Okay, but it's just the, the this this measure. But mu of x, I'm, I'm using a bit notation, but okay, mu of x is defined on the geodesic, and here I'm really writing it as a measure on on r. But I really I'm identifying between the push forward. Uh, of the measure on R via the, the geodesic map. So I'm, you know, I have a measure here on R. I'm really placing it here. Uh, you know, geodesic is length preserving, so this is really a metric measure isomorphism. I'm not changing the measure because I'm pushing things forward. I'm not changing distances. So I'm really just, by convenient abusive notation, I'm identifying between the measure on the manifold and the measure on R. Okay? And really, the density of this measure is this guy. And I, I notice I just moved the x downward because I will just want to 
Remember, I want to emphasize the properties of this measure as a function of t. So all I did is move the x downward. Okay, and that's my, um, my abusive notation. And this is the density of this measure along this. This is a geodesic, right? It's a normal map. Okay, this is a geodesic defined, and this measure is defined on the interval L sub f. Okay, <coughs> so this is a really one-dimensional localization. I call it integral because you see it comes, there, there, you can see the integral curves. It comes really as a localization arising from, uh, um, from the di from, for, for the function, which is the distance from this hyperplane, from this hypersurface S. Okay, so you can really see the integral curves here. It's not just some crazy, you know, needles going all over the place. Uh, it really is perpendicular to this hypersurface S. <coughs> okay, and the theorem, which I kind of keep uh, saying, uh, is, and, and I should say this is, so I'll call this a generalized heinze karcher theorem, and this is valid in this range of values of capital N. Okay, so the original heinze karcher theorem was proved in the 70s. This is a classical theorem in differential geometry. So, of course, back then, 70s and 80s, in the kind of the golden era of differential geometry, no one really thought about using a weight. So you, you work on Riemannian manifold. Okay, so this is the classical case, capital N equals to little n. Okay, no weight, just Riemannian volume. Uh, but this was then extended by uh, Vincent Bale in his PhD thesis to the range capital N uh, in this range, and Frank Moore then in the range capital N equals to infinity. And, you know, it's just the same proof. Well, it's not the same proof, sorry. Uh, the proof that I'm going to show you is kind of our interpretation. But anyway, it, it, everything works also in this range, minus infinity 1. Okay, anyway, the theorem is, in our terminology, that if our original space satisfies curvature dimension rho n, then for any x, all of these one-dimensional needles, all of these guys will inherit CD rho n, okay, automatically. So in other words, this is just a one-dimensional statement. What is CD rho n for a one-dimensional density? So Ricci is zero. There's no Ricci. So we're in dimension one. There's no Ricci term. So all the contribution comes from the density. And really, CD rho n means, remember, I need to take capital N minus the dimension where I'm at. Right now, I'm one-dimensional. So this means that minus logarithmic Hessian of capital, with index capital N minus 1 of this density is greater than rho on the interval L sub f. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. Mm -hmm. The the geometry of S is irrelevant for this statement. It's going to be relevant for something else in a second. Yeah, but for this statement, completely doesn't matter. Yeah. <coughs> but by the way, the geometry of S does affect that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a localization of mu restricted on whatever I can map from S. So if, if, if S is closed and I'm complete, then I map everything. Okay, but otherwise, that's you know. Anyway, okay, let's, let's show. Okay, so that's the theorem. CD rho n gets inherited by needles, uh, 1D needles. Important, actually. Uh, so here's the proof. So uh, let me call new the, so I, I just extend new to be the, uh, <coughs> I just extend new to be kind of the geodesic, uh, the, the, the normal ray along, along, along the, this, this normal map, okay? And uh, recall that my Jacobian is really a factor, a product of two factors, uh, the, the unweighted one coming from the geometry and the weighted one. So the first equation, okay, I, I was actually meaning to prove I was too ambitious, uh, for sure, but it, it's not, it's classical equation, uh, uh, Riccati type equation on the behavior of the geometric uh, uh, part of the Jacobian. It's, it's actually, it, it, it comes from the Jacobi equation, if you know what that is. Uh, I was planning to kind of prove everything, but uh, it, it, it's, it's really kind of uh, not, not complicated. So you take the Jacobi equation, um, you, uh, uh, you make some transformation, you trace it, and that's exactly why you get the Ricci curvature. Well, at least morally speaking, as I said, Ricci curvature uh, is exactly what controls the evolution of n minus one dimensional volume elements, uh, and that's exactly what we're doing here when calculating the Jacobian. So that's why you get the Ricci curvature. Okay, so really Ricci curvature comes up because our needles are one dimensional. Okay, for, for higher dimensional needles, whatever that is, three dimensional, you would not get Ricci. You would still get some some trace of the curvature tensor, but it will not be the full, it will not be Ricci curvature. But anyway, so again, you can, you can, you know, open your favorite textbook on Riemannian geometry, and this equation will be there for sure, okay? Uh, so unfortunately, no proof of that, but that's classical. So our only, you know, you just have to take into account the, the contribution of the weight. 
Now, for the contribution of the weight, um, so I, I'll, I'll just write in this form. For some reason, I want to calculate this. What is that? Let's take log of that and take derivative in time. Okay, so the, new, the denominator is completely irrelevant. I took log and I take derivative in p, so this is completely irrelevant. Okay, uh, and uh, since my guy is a geodesic, right? My guy is a ge geodesic, then the, I need to do the chain rule. I need to take the derivative of psi, but then the derivative of, of, uh, of, my, of, my, uh, of my normal mu in the direction of t, but it's a geodesic, so that's zero. So really, I can just rewrite this as really the Hessian, the Riemannian Hessian of log psi in the direction mu nu minus uh, this uh, exactly the same term, the gradient of log psi squared in the direction of mu. Okay, so uh, just because I'm a geodesic, I don't get any extra terms. I don't get any uh, <coughs> other you know uh, covariant derivatives of my 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 vector along along uh, the along uh, uh, the, the covariant derivative of uh, some strange vector uh, along mu. Okay, so this is just almost a tautology. This is equal to that, thanks to the fact that I'm working on a geodesic. And now, look what I'd like to do. I'd like to sum these guys, because I really want to know the evolution of j. I, j is a product, so lo, lo, this is why this representation using logs is so useful. Here, so here, if I sum, this is beautiful. Logarithm, lo, logarithm uh, sum of logs is log of product. So that's great, but, and, and this will sum to something. But here you see I have squares. I want to sum squares. Okay, uh, so it looks like I'm a bit in trouble, but okay, I know how to complete a square, or you can call it Cauchy-Schwartz, or whatever you want. And the point is that you have this type of inequality. I hope I didn't get the sign, the, the sign here wrong. A squared over alpha plus B squared over beta is greater than A plus B squared over alpha plus beta for any A and B. So I call this guy A, I call this guy B, I call this thing alpha, this thing beta. Okay, it's true, actually, if and only if, uh, up to the boundary, Either alpha and beta are positive. That's kind of the usual situation. If both of them are positive, I'm really in this range, which is kind of the traditional range. Okay, but it's actually also true. Just check. True if uh, one of them is positive and the other is negative, and also their sum is negative. Just check. Okay, you know, si you know, it's it's kind of annoying because signs get reversed. But if you do it correctly, you'll see that uh, everything works. In this range, and what is this range? So alpha plus beta has to be negative, meaning that n minus one has to be negative. And that's why exactly you get this range, okay? And there's a gap in the middle because it just it's the Cauchy-Schwarz is just false in the middle, okay? Anyway, so then if I do this, and I also add this Cauchy-Schwarz, then I get, so I can now sum, okay, using this inequality, and I get, uh, uh, again, the sum of the logs, uh, which is log of the product, I really get what I wanted. I really got the n minus one uh, logarithmic Hessian of j. And here on the right-hand side, when I sum, I get exactly the n. This is exactly, by definition, the sum of these terms is exactly the n-dimensional Ricci curvature tensor, which we're assuming is greater than rho, because we're in CD rho n. And I got the claim, right? I got what I wanted. This one-dimensional guy with index capital n minus one satisfies CD rho n. Okay, so that's. That's the proof. And actually notice that we proved, okay, just remember, maybe I use this. No, no, it's too big, maybe. Anyway, we really proved, okay, this, of course, this appears in a million of papers. It's, you know, this, this, this trick is, is nothing. Uh, but but uh, uh, we really proved this. For alpha and beta in this range, we really proved this inequality, okay? That's the whole business of localizing CD rho n. Okay. Anyway, the slides will be available if you want. So uh, finally, uh, so, so like this was supposed to be <laughs> done tomorrow, yesterday, and now I'm talking about isoparametric inequalities. So let's do an application for isoparametric inequalities. This is something I've worked on. So uh, again, remember that uh, uh, isoparametric, what are isoparametric inequalities? Well, I can define them on a general metric measure of space. So basically, I can calculate the boundary measure of a set A. And this recall the definition of the boundary measure. I take the epsilon extension of the set A I take just this part marked in green, okay, I divide by the width epsilon, and I take the limit in. Okay, so that's the Minkowski exterior boundary measure of the set A. It's, you can work with the, your favorite notion of boundary measure. This is just convenient because I don't have to define anything, and it makes sense on a general metric measure space. Okay, and uh, I, I would like to introduce the I, or call, or introduce this, the isoparametric profile associated to my space, which is this function I, Defined on the, so what, what does this function do? It eats 
uh, a volume, it's a measure of a set, so the measure of a set is between zero and the total measure of my space. Uh, so V, kind of little v, stands for volume. So it's weighted volume, you know, it's a measure of a set. So it's uh, defined as the infimum over all boundary measures of sets, A having measure exactly equal to V. Okay, so in other words, it's the best function that you could use as a lower bound on the boundary measure of the set as a function of its own measure. Okay, so it eats a volume and it spits out lower bound on boundary measure of a set having that volume. Okay, so that's isoclinic profile, I of V. We, we already saw some examples. Um, yesterday or yesterday. Um, and let me also introduce the flat isoprometric profile. This only makes sense when my, me when my metric measure space is just a measure on the real line. So let me introduce the flat isoprometric profile. I'm using this flat musical sign. It's exactly the same definition. The only difference is that I'm only allowing to use two types of sets, either rays infinite to the left or rays infinite to the right. That's why it's kind of flat. So you know, iso isoprometric profile, maybe I need to use kind of a very sophisticated set. If my measure is kind of ugly, my measure mu here is kind of ugly. Maybe I need to use disjoint union of the intervals. But no, for the flat profile, I only use you know, inf just one infinite ray, either to the left or to the right. OK? So obviously, this guy is more restrictive, so it's only bigger. I flat is only bigger than I, possibly. OK? So we'll use this later on. OK, so. What's the program to build this localization? This is the Gromov-Levy program. So Gromov, uh, Paul Levy was a probabilist in, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, he, he actually proved something in geometry for, that's, there's, so already Paul Levy had the foresight. He, he, had, he had in mind applications of probability, and this, he's maybe the founding father of concentration, uh, or at least kind of the ancestral founding father of concentration inequalities, which became kind of a uh, uh, very central part of probability, and these are connected to isoparametric inequalities. Uh, and Gromov in, in 1980 uh, actually kind of, so Polyvi's proof uh, had, let's say, it was not completely rigorous. Uh, it, 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 it relied on the theory on existence uh, and regularity of isoparametric minimizers, and Gromov in 1980 filled these gaps by, uh, and in fact generalized uh, Levy's result. Levy only worked on the sphere. OK, so the setup now to make this program work, it's exactly as before, but I added some stuff. Now let me assume that the manifold is complete, oriented with C2 smooth boundary. OK, still important that it's geodesically convex. And let's assume now that we have a probability measure. So actually, uh, we know kind of how to avoid this stuff by now. Well, this is kind of new, but we know how to avoid this stuff. This is unavoidable. It has to be a probability measure, not for technical reasons, for conceptual ones. So now mu is a probability measure, and I'm assuming that, again, psi is C2 smooth, I can take two derivatives, uh, I'm strictly positive, and I emphasize that it actually has to be positive all the way up to the boundary, including the boundary, using this technique, using this method. Okay, again, now, they, not now kind of we, we know how to bypass that, but using this technicality. Okay, but for this program per se, you really need all these assumptions. <coughs> so now we're going to consider a set having an isoparametric minimizer, so a set of a given measure v on which the boundary measure is indeed minimal. Now remember, in the definition of i, you used an infimum because, you know, who tells you that this infimum is going to be realized? Okay, but it turns out that the person who tells you, there are many people who tell you that it is going to be realized, and we actually, in Christina's talks, we uh, had a taste of this geometric measure theory, uh, along with its kind of uh, many founding fathers, uh, so many, many people. Almgren, uh, Gumbieri, De Giorgi, Federer, Fleming, Giusti, uh, Gondelas, Masaru, Tamanini, Morgan, Simons, kind of, okay, so many probably other results you need to use to, uh, to kind of uh, make everything here work. So not only does geometric measure theory tell you that minimizers, that's the easy part, uh, are going to exist, okay, so really there's going to be a set, assume that it's open, <coughs> on which the boundary measure is going to be realized, but moreover it tells you something on the regularity of the boundary, okay? So what does this tell you? What does this theory tell you? It tells you that mm, if this is if this is my manifold M, okay. Um, let's say let's first of all be optimistic. Let's draw A like that. Okay. So it tells you that the boundary of A in the interior of M closed. 
be less optimistic. Maybe this is A. Okay? So the boundary of A in the interior of M, so I'm going to take all of, so this is A, right? So I don't count this part. I just take the boundary in the interior of M, and then I take a closure. So I do take count of these points, but I, I, this is the boundary of the set A inside M. So it, I can write this as a, actually, a, supposed to be a point here, this joint union of a, a regular part, an open regular part, and a closed singular part. Okay, so there may be some singularities, like here. Okay, I have a singularity. There may be, there, there could be singularities on the boundary. Uh, but the, so the bad news is that there could be singularities. The good news is that this uh, incredible theory assures you that the singularity has Hausdorff dimensions smaller or equal to n minus 8. n is the dimension of the manifold. So in dimension, up until dimension 7, there are no singularities. Okay, in dimension 8, there could be actually isolated singularities. But anyway, this control gives you control on uh, the dimension. So th it's really a small part which could, could go wrong. So that's um, very uh, important information. Okay, uh, and the regular part is great. It's just a regular hypersurface. It's going to be as smooth as your data. Our data is that psi is C2 smooth. So it's going to be C2 smooth. Okay, now <coughs> this guy has more properties. It has lots of properties, which all of them are essential for their approach. So remember, our guy is an isoparametric minimizer. It's minimizing uh, weighted surface area, okay, boundary measure, under a volume, a weighted volume constraint, right? So it's minimizing something under a constraint. So just by a Lagrange multiply argument, you can make this rigorous because you, you, you can just, just take the regular part and do some, some small perturbation of the regular part, and you run the Lagrange argument uh, formalism uh, or, or not formal, I mean, the argument, it's completely rigorous. So you will see this, this, this means that the first variation of weighted surface area has to be a constant multiple. This is the Lagrange multiplier. Has to be a constant multiple of, so the, the first variation of, uh, <coughs> let's say, of, of boundary measure has to be a constant multiple, the first variation of, of measure. Okay, I'm just little, I'll write this like that formally. So what is this constant? This constant will be exactly, uh, if, you, if you do the calculation, what's the first derivative of weighted surface area? It will be exactly our Jacobian, our weighted Jacobian, the first derivative of the Jacobian at the point zero. Okay, because that corresponds to the first variation of, uh, of uh, uh, when I take my guy and I try to move it a bit, Okay, the first derivative of the area is going to be, well, the area is going to be represented by the integral, uh, by, by the Jacobian. So the first derivative of Jacobian is going to be the first variation of weighted area. Uh, <coughs> and that's going to be constant. Let me call this constant H sub mu A. And this is true for any X on the regular part. And really only the regular part, thanks to the fact that the, 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 the singular part has this such a small uh, Hauser of dimension, only the regular part is actually in charge of the weighted area. I mean, this guy doesn't contribute at all to the, to the, to the area. So thanks to the fact that the dimension is n minus 8, I can actually take something like up to 7 derivatives or something like that, maybe 6 derivatives, and actually all of these derivatives will not be in, all of these 6 or 7 first variations will not depend on the contribution of the singular part, only the contribution of the regular part. So that's why uh, this thing works. Uh, and this guy is called, well, without any weight, the first derivative of the Jacobian is the trace of, this is where the ge geometry of S comes in. It will be the trace of the second fundamental form here. So at this point x, you have a second fundamental form. Okay, this is, if you will, it's kind of a, a, a quadratic approximation to the surface at this point. So, you know, the tangent space is kind of the first order approximation, but if you try to make a second order approximation, uh, as some paraboloid, uh, this second fundamental form represents, okay, it doesn't have, of course, it could be a saddle, you know, all, all, all possible possibilities. Uh, so this is a symmetric matrix, uh, and its eigenvalues are exactly the principal curvatures. Okay, so uh, if they're all positive, you're convex. If they're negative, you're concave. If one is positive and negative, it's a saddle point, and so on. So the classical uh, computation is that the trace of the second fundamental form, which is called the mean curvature, uh, is, is this derivative. But here you see we have a weight. We have a weight. So this, 
this adds an additional factor to, to so let, let me call this guy the generalized mean curvature. Uh, I could write the formula, but it's, I don't think I'm going to use it. So don't, the only thing we really need to know is that this guy is constant along the regular part. <coughs> so the second thing uh, we need to know, completely crucial again, is that it turns out that the normal rays from the, just the regular part will actually sweep out the entire manifold. Okay, up to some measure zero. Um, okay, not the singular part, maybe not the boundary, just the interior of them. Okay, so the image of whatever I'm sweeping out, yeah, we, we talked about the, the image of whatever I'm able to sweep out is actually everything up to measure zero. So really, I can, if I go inward and outward, I'm going to get everything. And this is, this is very technical part. So when the, ma when the manifold does not have a boundary, this is an argument of Gromov. It's a beautiful argument. This, I mean, the whole thing really relies on this. Uh, what's the argument? He says, okay, let me take a point here. Let me take a point here. Yeah, let me take a point here. <coughs> take a point here. Now, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm afraid that we, so let me now take a look at the closest point on the boundary of A to X. X is bad, let's call this uh, P. Let me take the closest point on the boundary of A to P. Look, look at uh, how I drew this picture. You know, the way I drew this picture, I w no, no matter where I choose P, the closest point will never reach the singularity. So really, I'm using something about the structures of singularities here. What I'm using is the fact uh, that, uh, the so if I look at the, at the closest point on the boundary of A to the point P, what I'm using is, since I can draw a circle here, then I have a tangent. Actually, I know that the, the kind of the, 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 the tangent cone at this point, so I'm using the fact that, first of all, minimizers have, I can blow up at, at the boundary, and they always will have a tangent cone. And there's a deep theorem of Federer that says that the point is regular if and only if this blow up of this tangent cone is actually a half plane. Okay, but thanks to the fact that I can draw a big circle here, I know that uh, whatever tangent cone I have here, it'll only be in one half of the half. So it has to be uh, it, anyway, it has to be a half plane. So this point has to be a regular point. I can never reach a singularity. And that's very important because in general, <coughs> in general, you know, I, I, here, here's just a one-point singularity. I can look at such a cone. I have a cone with one-point singularity. Okay, let me look at the normal rays here. This is what the normal rays sweep out. You see I'm completely missing out this part. So. Really, uh, we're lucky that such a cone cannot be the boundary of an isoparametric minimizer. If it could, this means uh, I, can, I cannot claim that the normal rays sweep out everything. But this guy, as you can see, of course, this is a very ineffective way to close the volume. So it's not the boundary of an isoparametric minimizer. And we have Federer's theorem. Um, so this is what Gromov uses, this kind of very beautiful uh, observation that anything will be sweeped out. This works when the manifold does not have a boundary. When you have a boundary, you also need to use the, what was not available in Gromov's time, regularity theory uh, on the boundary points. And you have to use geodesic convexity. Because obviously, if your guy is not geodesically convex, maybe your manifold looks like this. And this would be your isoparametric minimizer. Then the normal rays would be like that. And you would completely miss these parts. But this is not convex. So you use the fact that you use the regularity theory on the boundary and uh, geodesic convexity to claim that actually we get everything. Okay, so <coughs> too many details, I think. Run out of time as usual. So the conclusion, what's the conclusion? I can create, every isoparametric minimizer induces a one-dimensional localization perpendicular to the regular part of the boundary, which I'll call S. Okay, so it's exactly the same formula as before. We can just take the regular part of the boundary, run what we had before, and uh, what we know is that this, uh, this localization, OK, what is the balancing property? It's generalized mean curvature balance. We know that the first derivative of the Jacobian is constant. The first derivative of the Jacobian. So this method is a method, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the machinery we would, like to, um, we would like to get is a machinery that, given any measure and a function f, which integrates to 0, I could create an F-balanced localization. This is not the case here. If you want, this only works for isoparametric minimizers and for a very kind of, I, I, I'm, I'm half joking writing this, uh, for a very specific function, the, 
the uh, uh, um, distribution Laplacian of the integrated function of A, because if you work it out, this exactly means that mean curvature is constant. Okay, so this is not really, so this machinery only works to get very one particular functional balance, only for isoparenting minimizers. This is generalized mean curvature balance. Okay, <coughs> so this is the property that we have. So we still have some control, something is constant along uh, every ray, not the integral of a general uh, uh, function that you, you, you can give me, but this property is constant. <coughs> so you, you can really kind of think about what localization that you get here. Okay, it's kind of a nice picture, I don't know, so maybe rays like that, and the singularity, they, they become shorter, but okay, maybe they, so this is the type of one-dimensional <coughs> foliation of your manifold that you will get, okay? Uh, and indeed, by the Jonas Heinz Karcher theorem, we know that if the original manifold was CD rho n, then each of these needles will be CD rho n when n is in this range, as we saw. Okay, so that's our starting point. And basically, let's try to um, let's try to see what we get. Okay, so basically, uh, as I explained, well, sorry, I, I explained this in a different context. Uh, <coughs> let's see how we can uh, get sharp isochromatic inequalities uh, on manifolds using this this starting point. Which, I mean, the, the one has to work to re reach the starting point, but now basically the, the problem is one dimensional. So we need one dimensional maximum principle. Okay? Very easy and very useful. Okay? This is just, again, if you're working with CD0N, you've probably encountered this in some version or another, uh, but it's very useful. So assume that on an interval L1, just one dimensional interval now of, of a real line, we have this kind of uh, um, second order differential inequality. So the work Hessian of, you see this calligraphic letter N, J1, um, I'm going to set calligraphic N equal to capital N minus one. There's always a minus one difference. Remember, so I'm using here calligraphic N, not to carry this N minus one. Anyway, so remember that's the, defi now, now it's actually convenient to use the, this definition of the logarithmic Hessian, not the, with the logs. But this definition is much more convenient. Assume that this uh, satisfies this differential inequality with initial conditions at zero, I'm equal to one, and at the first derivative at zero, I'm equal to h. It's second order, so I need two initial conditions. Actually, kind of in the sturm lotvin theory, they do interpolation, so they, their initial conditions are value at the, this point and value at that point. But for this theory, I need uh, just for zero from first derivative at my initial point, okay? Uh, and that's indeed exactly the situation that we have, because the Jacobian in the beginning is really one, because I'm I'm, I'm normal to the boundary, I'm perpendicular to the boundary, so the initial, uh, my initial conditions for my one-dimensional needles is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one at zero, and my first derivative is indeed the, me the generalized mean curvature. So I'm using the same notation, h. So that's the situation we have. So I want to say something about J1. I want to compare, I want to get an upper bound on J1. So I, I'll just compare it to the solution to the equality case here. So I just set here an equality with the same boundary conditions, okay? Then, you know, you, you know it's, it's nothing, you can call it sturm liouville theory, you can call it just 1D maximum principle. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's nicer when, yeah, yeah, by the way, so I should say, so this J0 is really the solution to this equality case. Uh, but of course, the solution could at some point uh, become, either drop down to zero and stop being defined, or explode, because N could be, calligraphic N could be, neg could be negative, which means that this guy could be actually exploding to plus infinity, so I'm just looking on uh, the solution on the maximal interval containing the origin where such a solution exists. Okay, no one says that the solution will exist indefinitely. Okay, if you think about sine, then it'll drop to zero at some point, and we know that our Jacobians are all positive, so I, I really don't want to, I want to stop the discussion at the first root. Okay, and then, okay, when n is positive, um, this is what you get, you would get that actually J1 it's always true that J1 is upper bounded by J, J0. And when N is positive, then L1, uh, so the interval of which my guy is defined, um, is a subset of the, so, so maybe my solution, so, so, so the, uh, this equation tells me that I'm kind of more and more concave. So uh, this maybe could be my, my, my J1, and it's upper bounded, this would be the origin, let's say, it's really upper bounded by the extremal model solution J0. Okay, so maybe my, maybe my guy J1, which satisfies the inequality, drops down to zero before J0, but J0 will drop down to zero 
uh, here. Okay, so J1 is always upper bounded by J0. When N is negative, they may actually blow up to infinity. And then you kind of have to reverse the roles of L1 and L0. So l let me not be fussy about this case, okay? But anyway, the proof is really elementary. It's nothing. It's, it's three lines. Um, yeah, why not? I think we can do the proof. Well, anyway, it, it's, uh, it's on the slides. Let, let me actually not do the proof. Uh, but it's really, uh, it's really elementary. Uh, and in fact, you get more. In fact, you get the information that uh, this is uh, indeed already, uh, this is kind of bishop gromov comparison or heinz sakarshik comparison. You get more. Not only is your Jacobian upper bounded by this model Jacobian, satisfying the equality case, actually the logarithmic derivative is bounded by the logarithmic derivative. Okay, so you can actually, this allows you to compare in all of these comparison theorems that you may know, uh, the surface r ratio of the surface area and the volume. Uh, so it really, it get, actually, the proof gives more. Okay, but that's the only thing we're going to need uh, for, for today's talk is this upper bound. So let me skip the proof. Uh, and let me, let, me, let me call this model Jacobian. So you see it depends on the initial conditions H, on rho, and on calligraphic N. Uh, so I, I want to write J naught, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it in this kind of strange way. I'm really, what I'm doing here is solving the equation for J naught to the power of one over capital, uh, one over N. And my notation here plus means that I'm, if the guy reaches zero, I'm, I make it zero uh, outside the interval of existence. And then I take back the power. Okay, so this may result, if N is negative, may result in actually J maybe explode, this model guy exploding exploding to infinity in finite time, and then I set it to be plus infinity outside, okay? And then really the corollary is that if I use this definition, then if my one-dimensional guy satisfies CD rho capital N, so really it satisfies this equation with this initial conditions, then my Jacobian J1 is upper bounded by the, this guy, this model guy, with parameter capital N minus one, remember, that's my, because of my dimension one, on the entire real line. Okay, so that's the thing to remember. Actually, if I use this notation, then actually J1 is bounded by my model, Jacobian, on the entire real line. It doesn't matter if they vanish at zero. It doesn't matter uh, if it explodes to infinity. This is true on the entire real line using this kind of uh, definition. Okay, so I have my comparison, 1D one, one comparison result. And, of course, what, what is this J? I can write to you explicitly because it's solving this equation, you see. If I denote this uh, to be, call this uh, whatever, this function g, I'm solving the, the, the first uh, second order differential equality that you learn. Uh, it's just a combination. You see, I move this guy over here. It just becomes a, com I wrote this equation again. I move, I move this guy over here, so it just becomes a linear combination of sines and cosines. Okay, so this is an explicit, of course, description of this, of this guy. Okay, just a linear combination of sines and cosines, s, k, and CK are these kind of classical functions that you see appearing in Riemannian geometry for exactly this reason, okay? <coughs> and I have to take the plus part, so just I, if it vanishes at some point, I make it zero, and I, t I raise it back to the power of n. And if n is equal to infinity, well, okay, maybe you use this interpretation and you get this exponential of ht minus rho over gt squared, okay? So you just, you just solve, it's nothing. Okay, so everything is explicit. Now let's combine everything. Okay, so given an isoparametric minimizer, having volume V equal to and boundary measure is equal to I of V. So uh, let's recall our, um, our one delocalization was that, right, into these needles, these needles that you see here, each of them satisfying C D rho N for each of the needles, and we know they're balanced. Now by the one dimensional maximum principle, we know that each of these Jacobian, the densities of these needles are upper bounded by the model guy. The model guy depends on rho, depends on n, but it also depends on the first derivative. Now, luckily, we're balanced, so the first derivative is constant. The first, so really, I'm upper bounding my density by, I, the, the bound doesn't depend on the location. That's kind of a miracle, otherwise we'd be in trouble. So this means that if I want to upper bound the measure of anything I sweep out, when I take this extension here, I want to upper bound whatever I'm sweeping out, then I can just apply, well, I, I apply my localization, my Fubini theorem, I integrate on the regular part of A, I go from zero to B, and now I replace my Jacobian by its upper bound. The nice thing is that this upper bound doesn't depend on X. You see, this inter I'm integrating over the location X 
here. I'm integrating over x, but this guy doesn't depend on x, so it just pops out. So this inner integral pops out, and what, I, what am I left with? The integral on the boundary of the weighted volume of the regular part. That's exactly the boundary measure. Thanks to the fact that the singular part is so small, it doesn't contribute to, to the boundary measure. So really, the boundary measure of A is equal to the integral of the density on the regular part. So this is exactly what's left. So this means that if I, ex if I take the regular part of A, I extend a long enough distance B, then on one hand, so, so on one hand, I can upper bound this by the boundary measure times this integral, which just popped out. On the other hand, if I extend to a big enough distance b, at some point, I'm going to cover the entire complement of a, right? I extend outside of a, I'm going to cover the entire complement, which has measure 1 minus b, right? So if I extend long enough, I extend long enough, I'm going to cover everything. This was the one of the points that we had. Proved first by Gromov, but then you have to kind of also take into account boundary effect. So you're going to cover everything which is outside of A, right? So uh, at least maybe you maybe I don't know, you cover you cover more things, but uh, so this is at least one minus V, right? So you get this inequality. On the other hand, you can do exactly the same thing, but now go inward. So let me just take normal ray. So I'm going to my, my normal ray, let's say, is pointing outside A. So let me go inward and do exactly the same thing. So at some point, if I extend long enough, let's say call this A, I'm going to cover the entire set A, so this has measure V. On the other hand, by exactly the same argument, I'm going to get this integral will pop out. The only difference is that I'm, I'm, I'm going in the inward direction, so really uh, the, the sign of my mean curvature, the initial condition for the first derivative is reversed, so I get a minus sign here. And I, of course, can rewrite this as the integral from minus A to zero of, the rig of, of J sub h, the plus sign. So instead of going from 0 to a, I can write this as the integral from minus a to 0. And we're essentially done. Why? Uh, our goal was to get a lower bound on the boundary measure of a. So you see, you actually see here two lower bounds. OK? You see two lower bounds on the boundary measure of a. So let's use the best of them. Let's use the maximum. The, the boundary measure of a is bounded from below by the maximum of, OK, v divided by this integral, or 1 minus v divided by that integral. OK? And really, um, yeah, yeah. So really, what's going on is uh, I can still say something if I know, if I have some additional information. Let's say I know that my diameter of my manifold is bounded by d. OK? Uh, some, some additional parameter, capital D. Then certainly, I have bounds on a and b. So, so if how much I need to extend in the outward direction plus how much I need to extend on the inward direction to cover everything is certainly, think about this, it's immediate, it's upper bounded by the diameter. OK, so what I know, I, I don't know what A, B, and H are, right? I don't know, I, but at least, so I have like three unknowns, but at least I have one constraint. I know that A plus B is smaller than the diameter. But other than that, I don't know anything, right? I don't know what H is. So let me just take the infimum here outside this, uh, this evaluation. I take the infimum over all A plus B, which are equal to D. I might as well take extend all the way up to the diameter. So if d is just an upper bound on the diameter, that's also fine. So I take infimum over all possible combinations, a and b, which sum up to d, and all possible mean curvatures. I, I, I have no additional information. OK, in this expression, you get something. It looks kind of horrible. But let me call this the Gromov-Levy uh, profile. And it depends on rho, on n minus 1, and on d. And what I got is this is the theorem is basically running the Gromov-Levy program, I got a lower bound on my isoparametric profile by this Gromov-Levy profile, which is, com it's, it may be horrendous, but it's, everything is explicit. This guy is explicit. You just, OK, everything is explicit. So this is <coughs> under CD rho n and diameter upper bounded by d. So I get this guy. OK, now uh, this is uh, kind of one. Uh, I mean, modulo, lots of technicalities. Uh, this is basically following Gromov uh, program and, and doing some generalization. Now, what is this good for? Uh, now it's hard. I mean, you have, now you start the one-dimensional analysis. Like, what is this function? OK? It turns out, and I'm, you know, I said I won't really talk about details of one dimensions, but uh, so this is a bonus. Um, it turns out that under some, if n is 
kind of between 0 and 1, something annoying happens, so let me exclude. So if n is in this range, or if d is equal to infinity, it turns out that you can actually characterize this guy. This guy is equal to some other guy, which I'll call the flat model profile, OK? And what is this equal to? It's equal to this another horrendous expression. So you may wonder why am I you know, trading in one uh, horrendous expression by another. Actually, this is not too bad. There are two upshots here. First of all, what is this expression? It's equal to, again, the infimum over all a plus b summing to d. I write it in, in such a manner, and also I have to take infinity over h because Anyway, I, I, my convention, if the inner infimum is over an empty set, I define it as actually zero. Usually the infimum over an empty set is plus infinity. I need to define it as zero to make everything work, so that's kind of annoying, but that's how it goes. What is this guy? I'm using the flat isoparametric profile that we saw before. So this is my shorthand. If i flat of f on the interval l is the following thing. You take your density f on the interval l, and you renormalize it to get a probability measure, okay? And then you calculate the flat isoparametric profile of what you get of this probability measure. Remember, I mean, calculating the flat isoparametric profile is completely explicit. You just have to test two cases. You know, either your set is, inf is an infinite ray to the left, or your set is an infinite uh, ray to the right. So this guy is completely explicitly computable. Right? I mean, if given uh, this is a function on the interval 0, 1, given a, a number between 0 and 1, I just need to find uh, uh, two rays, one of them infinite to the left, the other one infinite to the right, having measure equal exactly to v, and then calculate the density at that point. Calculate the boundary measure, which is just the density at that point. So this guy is completely explicitly computable. So the flat profile of my, I, of my model Jacobian what I do, I restrict it to the interval between minus a and b, assuming that this guy is indeed has finite total mass. Okay, I restrict it, I normalize it to be a probability measure, and I calculate the flat isoparametric profile evaluated at the point v. Okay, so you know this, I, I, I exchange one horrendous expression with another. Um, what is it good for? There are two upshots. The first upshot is this: this means that you immediately see that the result is sharp. Although the expression is horrendous, you see that at least immediately the result is sharp when the topological dimension is equal to 1. Because by definition, all of these one-dimensional guys satisfy CD rho n with equality, by definition. right? So you see that uh, I, I'm lower bounding the boundary, the, the profile, the isomeric profile of my, you know, my n-dimensional weighted Riemannian manifold by something and, and this lower bound is sharp, because if I test one dimensional, uh, if I test here on the left hand side this density, uh, I will get a sharp result. I will get an equality here somewhere for some parameters. I don't know which parameters, right? And these, in fact, these parameters for any v will, may depend on, on, for any v, maybe I will need to use different parameters, but this result is pointwise sharp. For, for at least in dimension one, you see it immediately. And in fact, uh, I kind of, this is the most technical part of, of something I did. A while ago, you can actually verify the sharpness. You can actually emulate, you can actually construct n-dimensional Riemannian, weighted Riemannian manifolds for any n. So not just one, one dimensional is for free, but you can actually construct n-dimensional Riemannian manifolds uh, for which, uh, which will verify the pointwise sharpness. And the sharpness is with respect to all possible parameters, capital N, rho, d, v. Uh, to be honest, I, a, while, I, I, a while ago, I was also kind of a sinner. I only thought about this range. OK, uh, recently I extended my results to negative dimensions, but the, the verification of the sharpness is horrendous. I didn't do it in the negative range. Um, but anyway, so, th so the first upshot is you see by, by that this guy, this lower bound is actually sharp. It's, it's the fact of life. And the second upshot, and with this I will conclude, is that actually this guy is tractable. You can actually compute it. So you see, I st you start to compute. You say, OK, there is an infimum over two parameters. But then you can say, you know, this infimum will never be realized here. It will, maybe these cases are equivalent. I can unify. And then you get a complete classification. So you get a sharp isoparametric inequalities for all possible guys of rho n and the diameter d. So <clears throat> I have two more slides, if, if you'll allow me. I think I still have maybe a few more minutes. So you get a complete classification. So first of all, of course, you have to, if, if, I, if I claim that I get sharp estimates, I have to recover the previously known sharp upper bound, uh, sharp, sharp isoparametric inequality. So the first, uh, of course, known inequality is the Levy-Gromov inequality. 
uh, which was generalized by Bell, it says that if curvature is strictly positive, levi gromov is only, to the classical case, having non-weighted uh, measure, just classical volume measure, capital N is equal to little n, okay? Uh, but this was generalized by Bale to all this range. So then the model space, as you may know, in the Levy-Gromov, so Levy-Gromov states that if Ricci is bounded from below by something positive, okay, then the isoperimetric uh, behavior is governed by the sphere having the same dimension, and you just scale the radius of the sphere so that its Ricci curvature is equal to the lower bound that you had on your Ricci curvature to rho. So if you just, uh, uh, for, for the sphere, uh, its profile is the flat profile of this density sine to the power of capital N minus 1. That's exactly kind of the, the, the volume, the, the surface area of geodesic balls on the sphere, okay, having dimension capital N. So this recovers, of course, the previously known result when curvature is positive. And also when curvature is positive and N, capital N is equal to infinity, so CD rho infinity, uh, there's the result of bakri du. Uh, which generalizes the classical uh, Gaussian isoparametric inequality of Sudokov to Lasson and Borel, uh, which in this language of the flat profile, so you see all, all of these two, all of this crazy infimum over two parameters just boils down to one case. And you see that the, the model space is a Gaussian measure having a uh, second derivative here equal exactly to your rho. So these are kind of, this recovers the classically known case where the model spaces are the sphere and the Gaussian space. But it turns out when n is negative, in fact, when n is even just smaller than 1, and you have no information on the diameter and curvature is strictly positive, you get a, it's, you know, I, I never expected this uh, af well, after some, well, this is new. Uh, you, you get a, a new model space. So you have an additional third model space. So out of this infimum over two parameters, uh, they all collapse to one model space, which has this density, cosh, so hyperbolic cosine, to the power of n minus 1. n minus 1 is negative, so this really uh, is integrable. It decays, uh, it decays uh, exponentially fast, right? Uh, so this is, a, you normalize it to be a probability measure, and that's your model space. So if you want, you can call this a positively curved capital N dimensional hyperbolic space. Capital N could be negative. So I don't know what a positively curved negative dimension hyperbolic space is, but this is my interpretation, just because of the hyperbolic cosine. So you get this model space. In all other cases, for all possible other values of parameters, there is no single model space. And this is why maybe they were not discovered before. These are classical cases. Uh, classical, this is, let's say, from the 70s, 80s. This is, so Bakri Ledoux is, let's say, from, uh, from, <coughs> from um, I forgot, 97 maybe. Uh, but uh, there are no other model spaces, which really annoyed me until I realized that's the fact of life. There is no single model space. The good news is that you can take your infimum over two parameters and they boil down to an infimum, actually a minimum, over one parameter. So for instance, if curvature is positive and capital N is in this range, but you have some non-trivial information on the diameter. Someone tells you, you know what, your manifold uh, has positive curvature, but uh, it's, uh, it's you know, strictly positive Ricci curvature, but its diameter is small. Okay, it's smaller than the diameter of the sphere. Can you do better? So in the 80s, Barabra, Son, and Golo could do better, but they didn't get a sharp result. This is a sharp result. So you still take a look at this one-dimensional density, okay? But here you have to take a minimum, so your sign. <coughs> Sorry, it's too long. So maybe your sign looks like this, okay? This is the interval 0 pi over some parameter. You want to say, you know, I, I, my, I know my space has a smaller diameter, so I have this interval having small diameter, and I really don't know where to put it, okay? I really don't know. I, I want to look at the density restricted onto this interval, normalize it to be a probability measure, and calculate the flat isomeric profile at the point V here. But I don't know when to put my interval. So what do I do? Given a V, I just going to, I'm going to take the worst location I can find. So given a V, I'm going to take the worst location psi that I can find inside this big interval, having the right diameter. Okay, and that's the sharp result. That's the right result. Okay, uh, and anyway, this continues on. You can do the same uh, with, with the kind of classical case of raw positive, n equals infinity, and that's my last slide. And you can see all the other cases completely classified. Uh, you see all these kind of nice densities coming up. Like sometimes you need to take three cases like hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, and exponential. 
this, this corresponds to the kind of classical needles that maybe Ashart kind of was talking about. So this is the case CD0. So Ritchie lower bound is 0. Capital N could be in this range. And you get needles of the form T to the N minus 1. Someone is really looking for me. OK, and uh, well, that, that's, my, that's it. So, so basically, uh, this is kind of T to the N minus 1, kind of Euclidean behavior. And if dimension is infinite, maybe you need uh, exponential needles, so this type of behavior. And you see this minimum, this is a pointwise minimum. And these are all sharp isoparametric inequalities. Uh, they may look not so, not, well, it's better looking than what we had before, but that's a fact of life. OK, you cannot do better. Okay, so anyway, the, I, I, didn't, I say I would not talk about one dimensional analysis, but this is work that I've done, so I use this opportunity to, to push on you, Mark. Okay, anyway, so I'm finished. Sorry, sorry for going over time. <laughs> okay, so geodesically convex, oh, yeah. uh, CD rho n, diameter d, yeah, but okay, but diameter, yeah, but in many cases, well, I, I kind of come from the community of convexity. Uh, sure, I mean, the, the sharp upper bounds uh, given the diameter. You know, if, if, if you're given the diameter, you can get sharp estimates. But in many natural situations, also coming from mathematical physics, the right normalization is not diameter. It's something else. And then there are big conjectures, what's the right order of magnitude for isoparametric uh, behavior and so on. So yeah, if your normalization is diameter, the answer is completely solved. Module the fact that you would need to kind of do this one, one, D, uh, one parameter optimiz optimization. Sorry, can you speak up? Yeah. Okay. The what? The regularity? So this is specifically for uh, uh, my, my, your, my S is the, is the boundary of an isoprenic minimizer, or it's any smooth? What about your object? Uh, th th this smells like a kind of a, a, you know Morse Morse Sard uh, slash transversality type theorem, right? Because you know the boundary uh, could be um, may really not be regular, right? C completely. I mean, even in Euclidean space, forget about Riemannian geometry. Just I, I just project to a lower dimension, right? I can do that. You're asking about the regularity of whatever I get. OK, anyway, it's completely unrelated to uh, what I was talking about. But uh, I'm not sure. I, I think my intuition is that I could construct examples where the regularity of the boundary is terrible. Is what? Ah, are you doing it on our end now or still ma or manifold? So you have you're, project, you're projecting something uniformly convex from R3 to R2. Um, yeah, um, let's. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the answer. Okay, so you know it's convex. That's of course much better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but the touching ball is from the dimension that you dropped, right? So y your question is, okay, you have some guy here, it drops down here. I, you know, I, 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 I get a touching ball exactly in the direction which you want it to project out. You're, you're asking about the regularity of this guy, yeah. the, something like that. So I don't see how this argument is relevant, but any, anyway, let's, I, I, I can try to think about this, but. Yeah. I, I don't see how it's related, but you know, I can try to think it up here. It's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. All all the models here are one dimensional. Sorry, maybe I wasn't clear. 
Yes. No, no. Oh, you, you, to show the sharpness. OK, so to show the sharpness, great. So indeed, what I do to show the sharpness for, for, capital, for little n being greater than 1 is I take my one-dimensional model density, and I construct a manifold of revolution, and I need to play with the radius. So, so now you know, the generalized rigid curvature contribution will come from the intrinsic geometry so, and, and, and the measure. So I need to put on it a measure, which of course will only depend uh, on, it'll be kind of a product, it'll only depend on this direction. Uh, it, it, I, I will try to, cr to play correctly with the radii of revolution and the measure that I put so that when I project down, I will get the density that I really want. And so that the generalized Ricci curvature is still uh, CD rho n. Okay, that's easy. It's kind of, it's, you see what the, what the equation have to be. But then there are billion technicalities because you may have to close the boundary of the, so the manifold I need to construct has to be geodesically convex. Uh, so this means I need to kind of close caps sometimes while preserving CD rho n. That's kind of a nightmare, but and that's why this is the most technical part. So not, you know, somehow I worked a lot on this, but I don't think it was kind of <laughs> worth, wor yeah, appreciated or worth the effort. So I mean, it's sharp even in dimension one, so and, and when n is equal to one, it's sharp. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. So first of all, this theory to make it work, I need orientability just for technical. I don't need it really, but f when I was doing this, I needed it because geometric theory is based on you know, as in Christina's talks, you know, so you kind of think of the boundary and uh, using integration by parts in a distributional sense. So if you want to run the usual theory, uh, you want to define things using integration by parts. You need Stokes theorem, you need orientability. So anyway, projective spaces. No, no, but there are. Uh, Ah, uh, okay. Anyway, so now, CD, uh, uh, I need a probability measure that's completely crucial for the argument, which you don't have. Why is it used? Forget about technicalities. I need probability measure to make sure that my minimizers exist. You know, math is not escaping. But moreover, that's just technical. Moreover, I need them for this part. I need two, I need two inequalities, v and 1 minus v. Without the assumption that the measure is probability, I would only get one inequality, and I would be completely screwed. Okay, so uh, it, it doesn't apply. I, mean, I need a probability measure. 